Hello and welcome to Under My Roof, the on-camera edition. In this episode, I will be speaking with iconographer Aidan Hart and iconographer Jonathan Pajot, who have joined me from New York and Montreal, respectively. We will be talking in this conversation about the relationship between non-sacred art and orthodox iconography. I hope you find it interesting. If you do, and even if you do not, I urge you to stick through all the way to the end, where you can find out more information about me, about Under My Roof, about Orthodox Exchange, and how you can go about supporting this work. Happy listening. Well, welcome to both of you, and uh, thanks again for, for being here with uh, with me today. Um, the, what inspired the invitation to you is some thoughts that I've had, partly in response to listening to uh, your own uh, broadcast, The Symbolic World, Jonathan, on sort of the nature of the sacred. I was particularly taken by one of the episodes uh, you uploaded uh, in titled, I think it was the desacralization of art mm -hmm. and uh, sort of uh, thinking about the the trajectory that you described uh, as art taking really in the in the uh, sort of early modern uh, period up up to the present. And um, so there were questions emerged that emerged sort of in listening that I wanted to put to to both of you and see how, uh, you know, how that might inform our approach to to art today, especially from an Orthodox Christian point of view. So um, I thought I would uh, put uh, an initial question to both of you um, to see how you might respond. And that is on the basis that you're both iconographers, uh, you've both earned reputations in, in uh, your respective parts of the world, as well as uh, in your, uh, according to your favorite media, um, for those who don't know, uh, Aiden is. Although I know uh, you've done mosaic work, Aiden, and I've also seen carving work. I, at least, and please correct me if I'm wrong, think of you primarily as an icon painter. Um, and uh, Jonathan, I've seen uh, images of your uh, carving work. Um, uh, well, online primarily. Uh, in any case, by all means, speak to far more than what I'm assuming about you both. Well, but, I see um, I see Aiden actually as a, I would say in some ways, a liturgical designer is a, a term that I would use for what Aiden is doing because his work spans from designing building spaces, uh, furniture, all the way into iconography. I'm sure, I'm sure icons are his biggest, let's say that he spends a lot of time on painting icons, but, but his, his capacity to kind of span the entire language of, of of medieval and orthodox art is quite exemplary like it's it's unique there are only a few people that i can think of that have that capacity so well i'm glad you've said that then actually um because a it uh it forces me to sort of expand my uh, uh, assumptions but uh, but equally uh, might uh, uh inform where this conversation goes in the first instance, what I want to know from both of you really is what drew you initially to the church's forms specifically? I mean, as artists, why iconography, why liturgics, why um, why uh, carving, etc.? Aidan, do you want to pick up on that one first? Yes, I uh, was a fairly active Christian uh, in the Heineken Church in New Zealand, where I was raised, and a professional sculptor, uh, modelling uh, figures and faces particularly. And my conscious objective was to try to find ways of indicating the spiritual nature of the human person. So I felt, well, I had to start with the physical. So I started off um, becoming uh, reasonably knowledgeable about anatomy, a model of fully realistic face, was influenced by Augusto Rodin and Michelangelo. That's a sort of preparatory stage, as St. Paul said, physical first and then the spiritual. Then, um, after doing that for a few years, I thought, well, now is the time to look for the spiritual element. So I looked at, I didn't know about icons then, I looked at African, uh, Egyptian work, any work that was very obviously uh, of a religious intent. And I noticed various elements, they tend to elongate, elongate simplify, uh, often enlarged eyes. So um, I went from one extreme to another and did a lot of simplification and gradually drew the two back together. Um, and started modeling faces, which I didn't know at the time, but looked pretty much like icons. Sort of rediscovered the wheel, as it were, for myself. And then a friend of mine who knew what I was doing said, oh, you must visit this monastery, Orthodox monastery. And he had heard a radio program about two Orthodox monks, one of whom was an icon painter. And my friend Ralph said, I think icons do what you're trying to do. So I innocently went down to see these icons and it 
just changed my life really. I, I've always been interested in I like deeper prayer and also what the early church was like. So those three things, prayer, sacred art, and um, and early church history, uh, all seem to come together in this meeting. So I, I was really interested in the monastic life. Um, so um, though I could have kept going as a sort of lay person uh, exhibiting, um, I was interested in the monastic life, so it was natural, therefore, to start more on the sacred art side. So I started carving with leaf icons, which is fairly soon, I think, Jonathan, when we met. When, when did you arise? Um, uh, I started, I mean, I started working around 2011, 2010, 2011. Oh, yeah. So all this happened in 1983 when I became Orthodox. So yeah. I came to England and, um, and expanded from icon painting, icon carving to painting and then mosaic. So it was that sort of search really for art that would help me to depict something of the, um, the fire in the bush, as it were, not just the bush, but the, the burning fire. Um, and uh, yeah, I realized that liturgical art, though it might seem to an outsider quite restricting, because mm -hmm. the ceiling is so high, what you're aiming to indicate uh, is just so high. In fact, it's not so broad, but it's a lot higher and deeper. It has a different form of creativity, which is, I don't know what you find, Jonathan, but it's more demanding than if one is free to do what everyone wanted. No, definitely. To me, the, you know, when I was in, I studied fine art in university to become a painter. Um, and, uh, you know, when I started working in the contemporary art world, I was really working in the world of contemporary art. And uh, I was just running up constantly against walls, one which I was a Christian also at the time. And I was struggling, I was a Protestant, and, and I was struggling to reconcile theologically the image making and my uh, practice. So it wasn't that there was an explicit hostility towards images, but there wasn't a way to integrate them. Like there wasn't a, a theological way to integrate them into my life. And, and so I was kind of struggling to find that. And at the same time, I was also struggling as someone who intuitively wanted to make things that were real, <laughs> make things that were connected, things that, that were not ironic and not like a comment upon a comment and so much of contemporary art, that's what it is. It, it has a kind of deep uh, aloofness and irony to it. Um, and so I was really struggling to connect those together to a point where I basically just destroyed all my art and gave up my work. I had a studio, you know, an artist studio and I just kind of gave everything up. Uh, and then it's only when I discovered medieval art at the outset, that I found what I had been looking for, I guess, the whole time, you know, this beautiful, powerful language uh, that was, that justified theologically the its existence, but then not just theologically, but actually in terms of integration into community, integration into daily practice integration. So there was a way in which it solved all the problems that I found in, uh, in contemporary art. It just resolved them. And it even resolved the deep question of, you know, because one of the problems with contemporary artists is they're always asking themselves, why am I doing this? Like, why am I making this art? And it's like this recurrent problem that keeps coming in waves in the world of contemporary art. Um, and for me, the, the, actual, the actual capacity to make an image for someone, you know, it's like someone gets baptized, they want to commission an icon of the patron saint, or, you know, we need a reliquary, or we need, you know, that even that practical anchor was so powerful you know, knowing that it also reaches high into the very veneration and, and worship of God, this participation in the, in the world of worship. So to me, once I discovered uh, traditional uh, Christian art, there was no turning back. You know, the, I had really found a language in which I felt like I could connect all these elements together for, for me. That's really helpful. Um, one of the things I can't help but wonder, though, you know, considering the the magnitude of the of the world around us, and while I know what I think theologically, um, there th there must surely be other subjects, uh, other worthy subjects of of uh, for interaction and of depiction, and so I just wonder if either or both of you feel any um, moments where you're 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 limited or restricted by the forms um, that you've chosen to pursue. Yeah, personally, um, even though most of my work is liturgical, I, 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 becoming orthodox and being involved in the icon has deepened my love of what one might call gallery art, you know, art that isn't intended to be 
liturgical. And I think that's for a number of reasons. One is um, if one's made in God's image with a thirst for him, so even an atheist, whether or not he or she likes it, is thirsting for truth. But they might be absorbed just in the way colour acts, like impressionists, were considered as people interested in the interaction of one colour after the other. But God created colour. You know, God created trees and the mono's pond and that. So I found that this truth discovered by artists um, is like a philosophical search. And the early church fathers you know, had to look hard at Greek philosophy and they discerned a lot of truth intuitively in that. And they didn't say, oh, it's all pagan, get rid of the whole lot, start from scratch. Um, receiving the Holy Spirit opened their eyes and ears to discern the voice of God, um, even though it might have been a bit distorted often mm -hmm. by, by human ear. It affirmed all that was good or even partially good. Um, so sometimes, in fact, I've done a few portraits inspired by fine portraits. I've done two or three that just invented faces because I was really interested in experimenting with that whole tradition. And I've been commissioned primarily by the, the, the King Charles, in fact, when he was Prince of Wales, to do some portrait commissions of his friends. So even though it was very really different in one way um, from an icon, I was still depicting people who are in God's image. So my icon background did come in to some extent to try to use a, a, a degree of abstraction, not as much as one would have in an icon, to keep hint at something of that, that logos of that particular person. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. I think that, you know, I see liturgical art and the language of liturgical art as a as a deep anchor. That's kind of the way that I tend to approach it. And so I see it as a, a source of relationships, you know, that are explicit, but also there's an implicit like dance that happens in the language of iconography and is also related to the architecture and to the, the liturgical year. And so entering into that powerful language and that powerful dance, I think is actually inspiration for possible secular uh, applications. And so I've been experimenting with that. I don't tend to go towards the gallery art and and there are reasons for that. We can talk about that later if, if you're interested. I tend to move more into popular art uh, because I feel like their popular art has a type of connection that gallery art doesn't have. It, we, we tend to see it as cheap, but there's a way in which it's actually used by people. Like it's, it's, it's closer to people's identity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I do think that there, there's a way in which once we kind of enter into those deep patterns of the church, then we can explore outside of that, whether it's in storytelling, whether it's in image making. Um, you know, I you know I published a graphic novel last year. You know, where I'm working on fairy tales, and I'm going to publish a series of fairy tales uh, in which the the hagiography and a, a sense of lit liturgy, and also in terms of iconography, will be deeply embedded into the way that that looks and the way that you'd experience but it's not liturgy right and it's and it, it's something you know uh, Aiden has this wonderful term which you call threshold art you know something which comes up to the to the to the church but doesn't come inside but is like a it's something that has a hint has a flavor has a, a savor of that which you can encounter in the liturgy uh, and in, in some ways can be helpful because liturgy is not available immediately to some people Mm -hmm. There's something about liturgy which can be almost overwhelming. You know, I brought a friend of mine just last week uh, to uh, to the, uh, the 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 uh, Holy Friday service. You know, uh, the the service of lamentations, and you know, he said it's dizzying. It's uh, to him, it was just dizzying because it's just so much and lasts three hours, and, and it's just non. It's just this nonstop wave and wave and wave, uh, and so it's overwhelming. So I think that. We can even understand like, you know, fairy tales or gallery art or popular art as a way to bring people, you know, with little breadcrumbs up to the door where they can then have a, a better encounter with with the fullness of the of the tradition. That That's uh, I mean, it's wonderful you should say that and you're by establishing a term, at least for us right now, uh, gallery art. You're you're sort of leading me into quest some questions that I wanted to to ask in a moment. But uh We'll, um, I'll pick that up in a moment. It, it, it leads me more directly to uh, another question then that's on my mind, and that um, concerns a, a visit I made to a gallery in Lviv, Ukraine, a number of years ago, in which they were displaying um, icons that had been salvaged from monasteries and churches, uh, probably in many cases over the Soviet period. 
they had uh, ended up being curated and, and put on uh, put on permanent display in this gallery. Now, it was an incredible opportunity for me because I was standing face to face with these icons that could have otherwise just disappeared. Um, and, uh, you know, they were they were you know, marvelous to to behold, but I couldn't help but to feel a sense of unease over the fact that uh, they were on display in an extra liturgical setting. I mean, they were they were sort of far outside the walls of the church. And it just reminded me of a Benedictine uh, monastery that I used to visit in in, in Canada, where um, the monks had t taken all of their relics out uh, in the pre-Vatican II reliquaries and put them into a glass case so that they could be seen as part of the monastery's history. Um, I find that bizarre because if relics are what we say they are, then you know they're not meant for display in that um, gallery-like way. In any case, um, I'm just wondering if you think the reality behind the icon is somehow uh, undermined when it's displayed in the way I've just described. I can understand the logic of feeling disease about uh, the icon, which is made for liturgy in a gallery. Uh, I quite understand the logic of that, but I think the icon is bigger than just being a liturgical work. Mm -hmm. And often wisdom is known by its fruits. Um, recently, I was in New York, sorry, in Auckland in New Zealand, to give lectures at a exhibition, a major exhibition of icons. I've done similar things in the British Library because of illuminated manuscripts I worked on. Because of these icons in a secular atmosphere, the door opened for me to talk very naturally about Christ in the context of this art. And and um, New Zealand's become quite a secular place. And the people who worked at this uh, gallery, it is a state gallery, said we've never had such a good response to mm. a talk. And it wasn't because I was any particularly good at talking, but it was just that they were thirsty. These people mm. wouldn't have gone to church because they've got all sorts of caricatures about the church. So the church went to them through the icons um, and then supporting the image with words to explain the detail touched a lot of, a lot of people. Um, the man who baptized me, Orthodox Father Ambrose, he uh, came across Orthodoxy in Christianity through studying Dostoevsky University. So for me, Dostoevsky is a threshold artist. Jonathan mm -hmm. introduced that concept just now. Um, as a sculptor, Brancusi, Konstantin Brancusi, to a lesser extent, Kandinsky, were a little sort of opening to, to a different way of seeing to me. So um, we don't seem to require to listen to sacred music on tapes while having icons out there. I think it does depend how they're displayed though. I've seen some very good exhibitions of icons. The one in Auckland is brilliant because of the deep colours they paint the walls and the designer there had studied mosaics, uh, sorry, had studied frescoes mm -hmm. and drew dark, those deep dark colours for the background colour. Uh, the first icon exhibition I saw in Britain was at the Royal Academy and they had really low ambient light and visible pinprick lights on the icon so it was like an oil lamp. Uh, it changed the atmosphere. You, it was almost like going into a church. So I think there are good ways and bad ways of doing it, but mm -hmm. it can be incredibly fruitful as a formation work. A bit like a monk leaving his monastery, like St. Um, Cosmos in Italy, you know, going out and preaching and going back to the monastery, going out and coming back, like St. Aidan of Lindisfarne, I named after. He did that. Yeah. He was, um, at Lindisfarne Monastery, and then would go out to preach and come back and go out. I think I think that if we think of it as hierarchy is the it's probably the best way to think about it. You know that the the highest thing that the the icon can do is is participate in our prayer life, but it also has different applications. You know because you, when you talk about displaying icons in galleries and that disturbs you, it's because you're not thinking that you see icons on Facebook all the time and you see icons online all the time, and those images. You know we've almost come to think that those aren't icons because they're digital images, you know? And so that, that, that probably has a much deeper effect on our perception of sacred art than, than, uh, than seeing an icon in a gallery does because it, you know, it, it creates this strange, this strange uh, space where you have an image of Christ. And as you scroll down, then you have some strange, almost vulgar thing that appears. And as you scroll down, there's an advertisement. And so you have this, like you scroll down on Instagram and you see a mix of icons and ads for something. So, uh, so that probably is way, it's probably way more damaging to our, to our perception of sacred art than the gallery. But like, like Aiden said, I think that, you know, in some ways 
these are the seeds that are that are that are thrown, you know, and some will fall into good soil and some won't. And if we if we continue to have a hierarchy where we do go into church and venerate the images, that we do go into church and venerate relics, and that will help us to at least anchor those more peripheral uses of icons uh, to something sacred. But I had the same reaction. You know, I was just at Mount Athos uh, about a month ago, and now all the monasteries their treasuries are organized as museums now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you go into the treasury, you go into the treasury and you're like, Oh, this is a museum with glass and descriptions and dates. And, and so it's a little, it's a little jarring as well, because you're wondering. So Mount Athos is still not a touristic tourist place, but it's like, it feels as if everything is being set up so that soon it will kind of just open up and become this, this kind of tourist, uh, this tourist uh, visiting a uh, place. So it's, I do understand why it makes you a little nervous, but at the same time, you know, usually I would not have access to the things in the monastery treasury. Like they just wouldn't show them to me because, you know, we'll take them out to venerate them, or maybe we'll take them out once a year when that's this feast of that, of that icon, but usually you don't get to see them now. Luckily I get to, I get to see them that, you know, Xenophontos has a nice, like a beautiful steatite, uh, icon like a 12th century steatite icon which which you know you don't see as pristine versions of steatite icons and so you know it was behind glass couldn't venerate it but i could at least see it so right i was happy <laughs> it's great for us practitioners isn't it to have these museum pieces because we can study them fairly closely in a way we got i was at saint catherine's monastery last year leading a group and it's so good to see some of the icons. The best ones have tended to put in their museum, but sad that they're in a museum. But I notice all sorts of things, which then I could apply to my own painting. Right, yeah, yeah. I mm -hmm. couldn't have seen. If it was in the church, you know, there were some amazing icons in the church, but it's so dark. It was, and they're really high up a lot of them. So you just, as a fact, you can't get anything from them, really. Yeah, and you, and you can't, it's hard. I mean, unless you kind of get permission, you can't just like stand there for... 20 minutes looking at one icon, people will start to wonder what's going on with you. That's, um, you're really helpful. I mean, first of all, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm picking up a whole new vocabulary, things like threshold art, which I, I really quite, uh, quite enjoy. Um, I will likely uh, steal it and do my best to remember where it came from. So, uh, People yeah, it's Aiden. He, that 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 was maybe ten years ago that you that yeah, you more, yeah, yeah. more than that, yeah. Well, in many ways, then, I guess my next question um, is is a natural one, because, uh, you know, my own uh, background is such that music is is uh, much more um, dominant. And uh, I can recognize sort of what you've called threshold art in the realm of music, perhaps better than than in terms in, in the, than in the uh, visual world. But in the world of music, of course, the church, both East and West, is served by that tradition of chant. Um, that magnifies the mystery in which we participate over the course of worship. Um, so in other words, it has a profoundly important part to play in, in what I call that priestly dance in the church. Um, but at the same time, I've been uh, personally enriched by, um, uh, you know, a whole host of music outside of the church, including artists that I know I mentioned in correspondence with you, but ranging from Leonard Cohen to Lou Reed to you two to Satie to Arvo Perret. Um, now, clearly, the visual world has its parallels, but I'm just wondering if both of you might share with me um, where you would point someone if they were asking you for advice on on where to begin when looking for visual enrichment outside of the liturgy what do you see as being sort of helpful in terms of perhaps this th a world of threshold art that would um you know draw somebody deeper into the mystery conveyed um by you know the, the world of icons good question it would pretty much depend on the person really i couldn't give a con blanche uh, reply to that but um a number of things come to mind here uh it's interesting, folk art in traditionally orthodox countries or, or Catholic countries. I have a book given to me by the abbot of the Beeran, where I was for almost two years, on Balkan architecture. And mm -hmm. what struck me, considering the interiors of these traditional houses, was that a wooden spoon, a wooden bowl, just was a work of art. I mean, it could have been a, you could have put it on a pedestal, it'd be like a bancuzzi. Mm -hmm. So, subliminally, the harmony that they experienced in the liturgy 
affected the way that they made furnishings and things. There was a love for the material. Uh, when you put a stone in the sun and then the sun sets, that stone gives off warmth. Um, so I, I would probably point them toward you know, the architecture, the folk art of, of countries, just maybe in a sense about what religion it is. I think it'll imbue what they do. In terms of more recent Western art, for myself, I found Monet amazing, um, even though he was sort of interested in the physical titillation of light. Um, Paradise was all to do with the interaction of light and matter. You know, light is an icon, an image of the Holy Spirit, and the material world is, a, is an image of the whole creative realm. And because he was interested in this interaction of light and matter, not just bouncing off the surface like Renaissance painting, but as we're entering matter and transfiguring it, I, I found um, Monet's paintings just elicit um, paradise so powerfully um, to me. Um, also Matisse, um, I've written a bit about how various artistic forms used in icons for centuries, in a sense, are individually rediscovered in early 20th century art. So with Matisse, it's the large flat areas of colour, the way he would tip things up. If you have a table like that, he would tip it forward, just like an icon does. Mm -hmm. he, he, though he, he was really impressed by the icons that he saw once they're being cleaned in, uh, and exhibited in Moscow. Um, he said, these affirm to me that the direction I'm going is right, so that he'd, as it were, sort of discovered for himself some of these iconographic elements. Um, he was trying to affirm the goodness of the picture play being flat. He wasn't trying to pretend it was deep. So these were things in, in the icon tradition already. Yeah. The, that, that was sort of three examples. I, th I think that the, in terms of secular, like uh, things that are outside of the specific liturgy, in terms of experiencing medieval cities or old cities, just that old buildings, they have a type of proportion that are so different from from the modern skyscraper, right? There's the type of humanity and the very proportions of of traditional buildings. And so walking, you know, like I was I was uh, in Vesele in my last trip to Europe, and there, you know, you just you walk through the city and there's a sense of in which the way the actual city is made, the whole city is almost like an extension of the narthex coming out, you know, southwest uh, uh, down the hill. And so it's almost like the entire city is a, is a an extension of the liturgy into the world. Mm -hmm. And so there are different places like that that can that can kind of give you a hint of what of what it is, this sacred dance that you that you talk about. Um, I, I think that there are in movies sometimes you can you can do, you can get also a little bit of a of a hint of this you know there there's a sense in which the use of light and the use of narrative and editing can can create these surprising uh, reactions in people that make them feel like there's something that there's something a bit more so there you know there there are places in the contemporary world where I, I think that that can happen. And there are a few, I think there are a few contemporary artists. Uh, I'm actually, it's so funny that we're talking about this because I just recorded a video because that one video I did on the, the desacralization and art was surprisingly popular. Mm -hmm. And so, because I thought no one cares about Andy Warhol and El Greco, but it seems some people do. So I, I made a video on more contemporary artists and how in some contemporary artists, uh, even performance artists, they, they, they have a sense, like they're wishing for ritualization. Right, they're looking for participation, but they hit a wall, right, which is the, the wall of contemporary art or the wall of the gallery space, where they can't totally break out and their languages are so idiosyncratic that it doesn't land, you know, it doesn't land like a communal uh, language of the liturgy, but you can feel that that's what they want. Like Joseph Boyce is a good example. Like there was something ritualistic, there was something almost shamanistic about the gestures he was making. But because he was in this nihilistic world where he also had the need to create a kind of personal idiosyncratic language, it doesn't completely land, but the desire is there. You see that in, in Anselm Kiefer as well. Like there's a, there's a desire to kind of break out and create images that are trying to reawaken culture, reawaken memory, but, but it, it fails ultimately, uh, but it can bring you closer in terms of at least expressing the desire. Okay. 
just uh, this is a footnote question that I might not even um, uh, I might cut out of of the uh, ultimate uh, production, but I am wondering about uh, Klimt and and uh, I'm thinking about the kiss in particular, and I remember looking at that with students when I was uh, teaching a number of years ago, and uh, it, it looks an awful lot, even his lines, the 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 outline of the of the principal figures in the kiss look like they've been lifted out of sort of the embrace of the Theotokos holding holding the yeah. uh, infant Christ. Is there Clint is a, clearly that... influenced by Byzantine art. It, I mean, oh, it's, oh. It, you can't, can't look at his images and not realize that he was somehow, I don't know his story, but he, he went to Ravenna or, to, or to, to Istanbul and was struck by, by the mosaics because they're, they're there in his work. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there's a difference between being affected positively by the icon or by some sacred tradition, like Jonathan was talking about medieval architecture, but there's another thing where you sort of appropriate stylistic elements of the icon for your own ends, and I think Flint sort of does that a bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's not a strong link in spirit between the two, but he's used external elements, um, and that, that's a more difficult area, I think. You know, something oh, doesn't... Yeah. An icon, but in fact, it has more of the logos of the icon in its demeanor, as it were. Mm -hmm. Something else might look a bit more like an icon, but in fact, its spirit is very, very different. Is there a hint of cynicism in 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 that um, approach? Uh, do you think, or is it um, just that it's uh, sort of wholly unrelated? Or what what do you think is in that? You probably know more about his sort of inner workings than I've no, done. I mean. It's it's hard to tell. Like if I think of Andy Warhol in in that sense, because Andy Warhol clearly was influenced by icons. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, according to legend, he went to church every day. He was a Byzantine Catholic. Uh, That's true. No, it's not yeah, and so, but but there's a sense in which the the space. So using the the the, the space of the icon and using this type of language, especially as you're reappropriating it to celebrate things that are that are strange and common. Uh, at least in, in Warhol's case, it feels like it's actually a reversal. Like there's actually a, an inversion of the icon where it's like we're using language that is in the icon to celebrate uh, a, a soup can, right? To put it up on the altar, right? To bring it up, which, which, is, which is strange because yes, we do believe that God is present in all things and that there's beauty in all things, but there has to be a kind of hierarchy where we have to be careful. You know, it's like if I make an, an image like a Klimt where there's some eroticism to it, but then I'm using the language of the icon in, in this kind of slightly erotic uh, painting. You know, what am I doing? What, what is it that I'm trying to suggest here? It becomes, it becomes a, bit, uh, a bit strange. And so it can be twisted, even though I don't think Klimt was, was necessarily ill-willed, Ill but it ends up uh, twisting some of the, the imagery, I, I think. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we'll all be aware of the conversations that have opened up much to the aggravation of some by figures like uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson um, on what might cons constitute what I'm calling a, a conscious and responsible citizenship in the contemporary world um, with a view then to reasserting a sense of connection to uh, more transcendent precepts. I've been unable to locate much of anything that um, Dr. Peterson's had to say about art, although I know uh, there is uh, some material out there. Um, it's certainly not the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about the things he's had to say. So what I'm wondering now is if you have anything to say about the state of contemporary art specifically and its relationship to tradition uh, with particular reference to everything we've been talking about regarding the, the Orthodox icon. Um, are we in a healthy place? Is there uh, some sense of um, calling back to roots necessary? I mean, um, are things desperate? What do you think? By the way, just a, just a detail. Like Jordan, Jordan is a uh, is an avid art collector. I think mm. he owns over a thousand paintings. He he he's a he's a he buys everything from kind of social realis realism. He owns a little Malevich painting and some some of the early modern uh, some of the early modern paintings. So he is quite a bit of an art collector. But his perception of art is very modern for sure. Uh, you know, in, in terms of contemporary art, like it, it, contemporary art, if we're talking about ga contemporary gallery art, you know, I think that contemporary gallery art today is basically, is basically the, 
the the margins of a medieval manuscript. That's what contemporary art is. It's it's an exploration of idiosyncrasy, idiosyncratic uh, element of life, and it does it quite successfully. But that's what it is. It's just idiosyncrasy writ large and exploded into the world. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I feel like the difficulty of contemporary art today is that it is something like putting the gargoyle on the altar. Right? There's nothing wrong with gargoyles. There's nothing wrong with with irony and and humor, you know, we it, it was part of medieval life and it's part of of traditional culture. If you look at uh, if you look at a at a at a at a orthodox iconostasis, you'll find all kinds of monsters and dragons, you know, carved in those in those details. But they're not the icon, right? They're not in the middle. And so this is the issue I think that we're we're seeing with contemporary art is that the the things that they're exploring, it's not like they don't exist or that they're completely illegitimate. But it is the the amount of of um, resources and the amount of attention that we're giving to to inversion and idiosyncrasy and and uh, and uh, and especially the, you know the passions you know a kind of broken broken reality fragment fragmented reality uh, to me shows that it is quite uh, sick I would say in terms of contemporary art. Is that, do you think, uh, sorry to jump in here, uh, Aiden, but do you think that that is a result of sort of despair or is it um, is it a deliberate sort of philosophical turn that seeks to uh, correct something that the contemporary artist, the ga contemporary gallery artist um, sees as as problematic in, in the tradition? I mean, what, what, what do you think motivates that? Well, I think... <laughs> The, so the way to I think the way to kind of understand it is that the modern world manifests itself in in two extremes, one which is a movement towards control and system and you know and, and explicitation in the science, the ration, the reason. And then and on the other hand, it moves towards idiosyncrasy and towards fragmentation. And so you know it's as if these two things are kind of balancing themselves out. On the one hand, you have this you have the state and the system, and the, the 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 science is being primal. So the artist now presents themselves as a counterpoint to that. Uh, and so they are all about chaos and idiosyncrasy and 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 revolution and uh, questioning. You know, it's like the idea that artists should question, right? This is something we almost take for granted. That's what the artist does. The artist questions. And so like as a as a content as a as a liturgical artist, to me, that's a funny statement. You know, uh, it's a funny statement to think that that's what the artist should do is to question. Uh, uh, it's especially when the word art actually means, you know, well fitting together. That's actually what it means. So it's like there's a different element of traditional art, but at least it can help us understand why, at least why I think that contemporary art looks the way it does. For the same reason, it's the same reason for rock and roll or punk punk music or or whatever. There's a sense in which they this this chaos and and um and fragmentation is a is a counterpoint to the to the system of control okay so i, I um, listen to you speak it comes to my mind that there are sort of three elements here one is we can't really talk about modern art as one big unified whole you know, got to almost take each work or each artist's work in their own merits um Secondly, I think the problem is not so much individual artists as much as the whole structure within they're almost compelled to work. Liturgical art has utility, it's got a very specific function. We're there as iconographers and the icon is there to mediate between heaven and earth, which we clear and everything is subsumed into that exalted aim. Whereas in art, what is the function? You know, is it to make lots of money for the artist? Is it to shop? Is it to make people think? Is it to decorate your wall? Make your pick and do whatever you want. So artists are in an incredibly difficult position. Um, and if you're in a realm which rejects uh, representational art, then you've got to dredge everything up from yourself. So you're left alone, looking into your belly button, trying to think, well, you know, this is worthwhile chucking out. I'll chuck it out anyway, see what people make of it. So it's an incredible burden mm. for the modern artist. So uh, it's an unenviable task, really. Um, um, but, but finally, I think, because we are made in God's image, we are thirsting, we are looking. So perhaps we can also have a more positive approach to modern art whilst understanding that I quite agree with you, Jonathan, that it's, it's lost its way. But it's always going to be there, we can't get rid of it. We're always going to have people painting who aren't liturgical artists. So 
as Orthodox, I think we've got to, have, and as, as Christians, we've got to somehow find a positive way of assessing it to affirm work that's partially good, that's very good, that's destructive. With Francis Bacon, you know, to mm. me, it's just looking at man's suffering and just sort of rubbing his nose at it. Whereas to me, our Gio Cometti, in our vote of Gio Cometti's talk, she sees the same loneliness of man, but he does it with a certain compassion. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's a really complicated thing. Yeah. But I, I do think we just can't just bash it all the time. We've got to somehow uh, establish an intelligent and affirmative but highly perceptive approach um, to these things. And I think we're, we're like the early church apologists I like. You know, we're a minority now, like the apologists, we're a minority Christian. So they had this thing, what to do with um, profane philosophy? Some of them rejected it out, but most, like Justin Martyr, um, had a look at it and tried to pick out John himself, the Apostle John, talking about the Logos. Yeah. We, I said that as word, but he was taking on a whole uh, ignorant meaning of that word from Neoplatonism. Yeah. So essentially, we've got to do what the apologists did, discern. Well, there's definitely, there's definitely, for example, in in a installation art, in some installation artists, what you'll find is a desire to break the passive passivity of the viewer, which mm -hmm. which is extremely useful for us, like as liturgical artists, to understand that that that's what they're trying to do. Like I was, uh, you know, I was thinking a lot about Marina Abramovich because you know she was so demonized during the whatever Pizzagate thing. Uh, but you can see that that's what she's trying to do. Ab Abramovich, with all her faults, you know, she's trying to break the passivity of the of the consumer artists and trying to, to provoke, to make people feel like they're entering into a space that they have to engage and that they, they're they almost in danger or she's in danger. And so there's a, the stakes are are high. Like we know that this, the icon is a is an image that exists with very high stakes. It's not a passive object of of contemplation, right? It is venerated. It performs miracles. It it there's all these things that are that are, the, the liturgy is not something without stakes. And so you see that like Banksy is a, an example as well. You know, if you think of people doing graffiti art or political art, you know, I can think that it's a little sometimes maybe the comments are trite or that that it doesn't become very deep but the desire to have activated art that isn't just a type of consumer experience that is something that i think as liturgical artists we can kind of point to and say that desire right that desire is is the same desire that would lead us into the church that's i i, I love everything that both of you have just said um not least because it's a corrective to me myself you know i i talked about music and and the the experience I have of music, I find it much easier to sort of uh, hear and detect um, the the kind of the artists that sort of cut through the the hubbub and and actually speak and 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 draw uh, us deeper, um, whether they do it uh, advertently or inadvertently. But um, what you've said actually gives me a bit more sympathy, perhaps, with the Tracy Emmons and the Damien Hirsts of the world than than I would otherwise have, because certainly uh, instinctively, uh, it's yeah, not Damien Hirst is not the one I have the most sympathy for. Let's be honest. <laughs> no, no, there are no. artists that that that, <laughs> that, that bring out more sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I mean, that they yeah. can change. I think you know the the the, the young British artists. They set out at art school to be famous. They're quite open about it. Yeah. You know, they wanted to be famous, they wanted to make lots of money, and basically they just wanted to shock, they felt to shock people is the way to do that. But with time, decades, Sydney Tracy in them has it's changed a bit. Mm. I know some people who know her, and she's into drawing now and more, more sensitive. So people exhaust themselves with this thrashing around trying to shock people and punch people on the nose. They realize that you can't keep punching people on the nose. Mm. It's a, wears you out and wears them up so yeah i think we've got to acknowledge that people hopefully do do change that they might start out as just shallow artists but, but do mature but i, I don't think uh, i think tracy and amy has but i, I don't think Hurst has. <laughs> yeah yeah well he's trying to break out the only thing that i could say it's it's horrible to talk about someone like that but the, the, the one thing that i could say about what he seems to be doing that might be useful uh, in terms of art is to break down the the um, the uh, gatekeeping of the gallery world. And that he seems to be trying to break through that uh, and to 
because that has been one of the issues in the in contemporary art has been you know because of the problem of quality right of knowing which artist is actually has quality it ends up actually being a political power game of gatekeepers they're the ones who decide who are the artists that are worth it and so the collector and the and the gallery the gallery owners they have an entire system of deciding who 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 gets access to the art and so one of the things that her seems to be doing is trying to shatter that because he's so powerful that he has the capacity to bypass the the gallery system and 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 put his work right out into the public uh, in ways that that I think in the long term might be useful because that that whole hi weird hierarchy of of collectors and gallery owners redu it it is one of the problems of contemporary art is that it actually makes art only into prestige objects and objects of ex of commercial exchange which is not great to reduce art to that. Yeah. It's sort of related to what we're talking about, but a bit further on as well, going back rather to threshold art. I have a friend actually, he's a Sufi, he's a New Zealander, who's lived in China about 30 years, and just loves orthodoxy and he's commissioned quite a few icons. But he bought one, two of my, what I call fine portraits. These are faces I made up, but inspired by the fine tradition. And um, especially after COVID, he had to do a lot of his discussions with his business partners. He runs an investment company by Zoom. So sometimes David brings me up and tells me experiences he's had from business people who comment on the pictures on the wall behind. And he's got icons behind, but also some of these, these portraits. And normally it's the portraits rather than the icons that struck them because the, the icons are a bit too a bit religious to these fairly secular very successful businessman, mm. but the zoom on the fine portrait. And I said, I've been talking to you for years, but I can't take my eyes off this woman's face behind you. Tell me the, the background to it. Mm. So it's interesting that in this sort of secular context, there is a form of threshold art that that um, can really touch people because it bypasses their preconceptions of, of religion. I remember a, an Orthodox convert priest came to my hermitage where I used to live with some of his, his converts and they talk about orthodoxy this, orthodoxy that, orthodoxy this. And I just said, forgive an orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is life with Christ. You know, you're a human being, you're not a religious. God didn't create us to be religious people. God created us to be full human beings in love with the living God. We have these oxies and all that only because we need to clarify things sometimes. It's not of the essence. And so I think if we sort of consider art in the context of just people thrashing around trying to find truth, I think we need a certain compassion as, mm. as well. I mean, all these artists are born into a pretty messed up world. Mm. And they're philosophers, some of the best of the philosophers seeking in their own particular way with all their weaknesses, you know, to find some sort of truth or even if it's, you know, the, the tragedy of life, like Rothko, you know, the tragedy of life, that's what he was depicting in some way. Mm. In light of everything both of you have said, I think my uh, last question is going to it feel somewhat deflated to me, but that's that's a good thing because you've covered so much. But uh, I will put it to you anyway. And if you don't know what I mean by it, uh, by all means, try to seek clarification, but I'm not sure I know what I mean myself. So bear with me. But I'm reflecting on um, Jonathan's uh talk on the de desacralization of art and and for any listeners of mine now who haven't uh, visited that I would urge them to but in it uh you Jonathan sort of you you trace the trajectory of art and and sort of its its um characteristics from the, the sort of post medieval period to the to the contemporary and um I found that really quite interesting and I wondered the whole time I was listening if there was something we might call a traditional continuum across that time span because you see this sort of rapid evolution of form um but you know within it I can't help but wonder if there isn't some kind of core some kind of element that we would that connects us with the art that comes before it and if there is uh, such a continuum is it desirable to name it or would that become too prescriptive i mean would that actually inhibit the artistic process when my in my perception i think that there is there is a continuation the difficulty is that the continuation is often not uh spoken of it, it doesn't actually appear in the books and so if you if you take if you take Michelangelo, for example, and everybody will talk about his creative creation of adam but that image never lands 
nobody copies it. It doesn't mm. enter into the language of normal people. It doesn't enter into the churches. But with you, with you, you look at a early 20th century prayer card in a little Catholic pa parish, and that prayer card looks more like an icon. You know, it 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 will put the saint in the middle. There'll be maybe something a little off about it, but in general, there'll be you know. So when you move down into folk into folk imagery, the I think the 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 aesthetics of the of the medieval world just become kind of inevitable. Mm -hmm. Andrew Gould did an amazing uh, wrote an amazing article about going to New Mexico and finding these indigenous people that converted to, to Christianity in the 17th, 18th century. And then they, they re-iconized Baroque art. So they, they basically looked at Baroque art and then tried to copy it, but because they had very grounded kind of sensibilities, those images from the Baroque ended up moving more back towards the icon in their representation. And so I think that if we look at folk art, so for example, if you look at, there's a, there's a line, if you think of, for example, the arts and craft movement, it's not perfect, but the arts and craft movement had a sense of integration, that a sense of, you know, and this is 20th century, this isn't like, this isn't old. They had a sense of, you know, we need to make things for people to, you know, we make chairs, people sit in, we make, we make deco decors that uh, allude to the natural that have, that have so there there's always some remainder that you can find i think in through the line of the uh, of the uh, of the history of art uh you know sometimes it's a little harder to find but i think it's always there mm -hmm. you mentioned jonathan the meaning of the word art as artists is is to um fitly join together and that works for many levels doesn't it it's the vertical you're you're joining together heaven and earth but also if you work with color joining color to color form to form and all these, if they are uh, to fitly join together, have got to relate to God-given laws of the universe. So you're going to find this continuity whenever there is a genuine desire to create something, not just for aesthetic beauty, but a chair to put to stand up, needs to obey basic laws of stress and compression. Um, you can make a chair badly by having it overly dimensioned, it's too thick, unnecessarily thick, so it looks rather ugly. Um, but you know, in old days, it's quite hard work sometimes to get wood and cut it. So, yeah. by necessity, yeah, you you had to understand stresses so that you, you didn't use too much wood for it. So, like the Concorde, the designers for the Concorde, they knew it's going to be beautiful because to go that fast, it had to follow the laws of physics. Mm. By nature, quite quite beautiful. Yeah. There's no sort of excess <laughs> to the laws of physics. <laughs> And you, you find like, it's interesting because through, and Aiden has been wonderful at pointing this out. It's like you, you find in modern art, especially early 20th century art, you find in some of the artists a desire to kind of reconnect, uh, to reconnect to something that's more, that's more grounded and at least has, has more proportion. Uh, you know, if you think of, so this is a simple example. It's like, so, you know, Ananda Kumaraswamy was the curator of the Boston Museum in like the 1920s. And was hanging out with Joseph Stieglitz and George O'Keefe and all of these modern artists in America, but was promoting through the to the engagement of Indian and Buddhist art something which is closer to what a medieval uh, art would look like or what icons would look like. And so, like I said, so if it's sometimes it's hard to see, but if you kind of look, like people's fascination for Persian miniature and for all these all these these foreign arts is actually their desire to connect to something that has that has more more engagement and more proportion which can be find found in icons and in and in traditional arts and so even now if you think of people like Christopher Alexander or the the new urbanist movement you know these are these are people who are defending what what liturgical artists would think is completely natural but are doing it now in a contemporary setting and and saying this is what is human this is what humans actually don't feel comfortable surrounded by giant skyscrapers they they feel uneasy and this can be explained through biological processes through explaining the the perception that we have and and so a defense of of proper space for proper function ends up looking like traditional architecture and traditional design in that sense, materiality has affected 
modern architecture, when you're working with bricks and stone, generally you make them the size of one person can lift them up and put them into place. So just from a practical point of view, everything is made of human sized module. Concrete mm -hmm. is literally monolithic. You know, monolithic means one stone. So a concrete building is just one big block. And especially reinforced concrete, because the Romans used concrete to great effect, but they didn't have iron bars to reinforce it. So the Pantheon is, is actually concrete, people don't really understand. Mm, yeah. um, but um, reinforced concrete, well, it's not evil in itself, but it has very few weaknesses. So you can do whatever you want, basically. Um, whereas a brick or stone building has got to have an arch. You can't put a straight bit of stone across for too far from this brick. Um, so uh, a bit like the visual arts with the gallery set up, it sort of forces people to do things a bit unnatural in a way. Mm. Likewise, with a lot of modern materials, um, there's so few limits that it's easy to get it wrong. Father Vesalius, the abbot of Veron, my monastery in Athos, often would say there are epochs where it's difficult to get things wrong, and there are epochs where it's difficult to get things right. Mm. And part of that is the materials available. Yeah. Uh, sometimes iconographers come to me and say, oh, could you give me a bit of advice? And normally it's just get rid of all those bright synthetic cadmiums. You know, the mm. materials they're using to shout. Yeah, it's possible to use these, you know, subtly. But generally I tell them it's, you know, if you're going to end up using some of those, well, at least start with natural pigments because you'll be attuned to more gentle um, colors. That's an interesting way of seeing it. You know, that, that when I think of the image of the heavenly Jerusalem, that seems to be the image that's given to us, right? It's the idea that in the middle is the garden, in the middle is the tree, in the middle is this natural pattern. And then it's okay to have walls and have a more technical aspect on the on the outside, on the outer rim, but there has to be a proper understanding of hierarchy. And the hierarchy mm -hmm. isn't just one of capability and a power, but is one of engagement and meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in some ways, it's possible that the like the, the anything goes of contemporary art and also the anything goes of architecture, the anything goes that technology offers is forcing us to be more deliberate and to understand things that maybe for ancients was just intuitively right. They didn't have to explicitly understand it, right? It's like you said, if you're going to build with bricks, you have to make an arch or else it won't hold up. And so for us now we have to, we have to be deliberate. It's like, Oh, maybe there's something about the arch, which is also natural in more ways than just the fact that they hold the building up, that there's something about that experience of moving into an art space that connects to human proportion and to human to, to human level uh, engagement. Uh, and so in some ways it is, a, it's an adventure for us to be able to rediscover that with, with a, and have to explain it and be more deliberate about our actions. I think it's why your talks on symbolism have been so successful because if you get rid of the divine God, whatever you call him, you just shift the horizontal. Um, it's just sort of chaos, really. But if there's a hierarchy, one level is an image of that, and that level is an image of that. So there's a verticality that, that gives order, but not in a sort of a scholastic, sort of dry way, but um, in a dynamic way. And this is why I think iconography shouldn't be limited just to these images we paint. Mm. The whole of life is iconographic, and St. John of Damascus spoke about this, of course, that the Logos is the image of the Father. I mean, we're the image of the Logos and everything goes down from, from there. So it's this verticality, I think, the loss of it, which has is, is led to so much chaos. Yeah. Um, but that's why I, I'm, I'm here at this conference, the Scarlet Conference at Princeton University. And the whole theme there, particularly my talk, but I think the whole theme of the conference is start with the liturgy. If a culture is falling apart, look at what it worships. Um, you know, the image of paradise is that God planted a garden. When you plant something, when you make a garden, you express yourself through that garden. So God created the world as like a wild forest, as it were. Then he plants a garden, which is an icon of image of him. And he puts us in it and says, now you make the whole world a garden. Mm -hmm. Expand the, uh, the, the boundary of paradise. So our dominion then is not you know, be tyrannical. Our dominion is given like... Um, Jonathan's uh, dominion over the steatite is not there to sort of grind it up and punish it, it's to transform that flat bit of steatite into a window to heaven. Um, so everything falls into place when you've got this idea of, of hierarchy, you've got this paradise which you're going to expand. So our prophetical, our priestly, 
and our kingly role all fits in there. We know where all those faculties are pulling. Get rid of the vertical and what is meant to serve becomes a, a means of a crushing of a power, mm. of dominance. That is fantastic. And uh, Aiden, I will put you on notice because you have agreed already that uh, you and I might have a, a separate conversation, and I think it will be uh, focused on uh, uh, the, the priestly um, nature of uh, the icon and uh, and hierarchy. Um, just as